Unlike Christianity, Islam doesn't have a central authority that can hand out an excommunication order. There's no pope that has the ability and license to make such a ruling. The closest Islam gets is with its highest ranking religious scholars. It's the imams and muftis who might be able to have a certain level of theological aptitude and knowledge of jurisprudence to be able to even come close to taking that call. But even then, they don't always align or have consensus in terms of where the red lines are drawn. It's quite an elastic enterprise. You are a coward. You are a kafir as well. You are a disbeliever of Allah. You are, you are excommunicated from the religion of an Islam. And still, with that limitation, in today's world, we see as ordinary more and more judgments passed on Muslims by their own creed or compatriots, be it a political foe or religious opponent that needs to be taken out or cancelled. The questioning of one's devotion, morality, ethics and integrity is weaponized for ulterior motives, outside of the faith and religion, and more about exercising power or instilling fear. So in Islam, it's not really about excommunication as per Christian connotations and understandings. The more appropriate term is takfir, to judge and convict one of being an unbeliever, even if they're Muslim. And I'll be using this term takfir throughout the video because of its specific expression and extremist consequences. Takfir is the accusatory act of judging someone as a heretic or infidel, whereas the term kafir denotes a person accused or convicted of either being an apostate or an unbeliever. When I suggest that takfir is extreme with its consequences, I mean it in comparison to Christian excommunication, where the takfir consequences for Muslims are much more harsh and can ultimately, even though with great complexity and difficulty, lead to capital punishment. In other cases, it was a license to action jihad against those non-believers. Now, just so we are aware, kufr, K-F-R, the three-letter root word in Arabic, means disbelief, heresy, or impiety. And all its variations, such as kufr, kafir, kuffar, that's plural for kafir, are all found extensively in the Quran. All exist within the word of God, except for takfir, the act of accusation and judgment. Not one reference of this word is in the holy book. The same goes for the hadiths no mentions of takfir can be found. And maybe that's why takfir has such a major stigma associated with it. That there's not one written word in the Quran that condones it, not one hadith that supports its use. Its application is generally forbidden as consensus tells us that no one but Allah can be judge and jury. No one but God is able to determine who might have crossed the unbeliever threshold or not. Its dangers are enormous and can cause all sorts of strife and injustice. Its use, though, has garnered greater and greater appeal as Islam went from its infancy to the modern era, up until today when we witness the likes of extremist religious groups use such tactics to instill fear or doubt onto others. This development and application came over a long period of time, and that is what we'll be taking a look at in this video. How takfir evolved over the ages in terms of its assimilation into the religious discourse and political calculation. There's a long and drawn out road that links the development of takfir and its progression from early Islam to the modern era. These points in time start off very early, only a couple of decades after the Prophet's death. And in the analysis of their sequence, one can identify a clear progression of thought and application of takfir. First with the Kharijits and their takfir of the Caliph of the Islamic nation, a judgment that was of a single person, and all the way to the Islamic State and its takfir of every Muslim that didn't buy into their version of Islam, no matter the sect, race, or creed. And what we come to realize is that as time passed, takfir expanded exponentially, from judgment of a single religious doctrine, to then judge a set of beliefs, to judge incorporated traditions, to even judge basic religious fundamentals, all the way to then include judgment of political allegiances and societal behavior. The first recorded case of takfir was witnessed with the Kharijits, the first breakaway sect within early Islam. During the first fitna or first civil war in 656, Ali, the fourth caliph, had agreed to arbitration with his counterparty, the governor of Syria, Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan. 
to conclude the war and reconcile the leadership of the Muslim nation. The Kharijites rejected the arbitration and believed the credo, no judgment, but by that of God. And that war was the only means to the civil war's end. They became disenfranchised by Ali and his actions, therefore applying takfir, hence labeling Ali a kafir. Eventually, the Kharijites would assassinate the Caliph in 661 as punishment for his supposed heresy. Two centuries later, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, a major scholar and jurist of the highest caliber, began down a road of harsh criticism of preceding and contemporary scholars and thinkers such as Abu Hanifa, that would be just shy of a takfir, such as making a statement like, for me the opinion of Abu Hanifa and Dung are the same. And in Abdullah uh, ibn Hanbal's son's book, Kitab as-Sunnah, where he recorded the opinions and words of his father, presented were the instances when Ibn Hanbal applied takfir onto Abu Hanifa. Are you not astonished that Abu Hanifa says the Qur'an is created? Say to him, you kafir, you zindiq. Such recorded statements would set the wheels in motion for the craft of takfir that would soon follow, especially those targeting Muslim scholars whose ideas and reasonings went far beyond the theologically acceptable. Two more centuries pass, and another extremely important thinker and jurist, Al-Ghazali, introduces the element of takfir onto not only Ibn Sina and Al-Farabi, but also onto a large contingent of Muslim philosophers of the preceding 200 years. In his book Tahafut Al-Falasifa, The Incoherence of Philosophers, Al-Ghazali labels the various polymaths as heretics and unbelievers disguised as Muslim scholars. His commentary on the philosophers and their ideas came in the rejection of classical philosophy and its revival with Muslim enlightenment, a revival of reinvigorated reasoning and philosophy that challenged the epistemological course of Islamic thought. For this, Al-Ghazali would call for the posthumous banishment of their ideas and writings. Another similar duration elapses, and Ibn Taymiyyah, himself a member of the Sunni Hanbali school of jurisprudence, comes onto the scene. Pushing for the return of Islam to its original sources, the Qur'an and the Hadith, the sayings and acts of the Prophet. Ibn Taymiyyah would go on to practice takfir on a great number of Muslims, both individuals and groups. At one end, it was the person of Ibn Arabi, the Sufi mystic, while on the other, it was the entire nation of Shia Muslims, declaring them as kuffar for deviating from Islamic beliefs, based on his specific interpretation of Islam. Even newly converted believers like the Mongols and the Tatars were labeled as heretics as they hadn't yet fully incorporated all aspects of Muslim obligations. One side note to be made about the preceding three Muslim thinkers is that although they did apply takfir, they did so with care and caution. They did not knowingly attempt to give more credence to this method of incriminating and ostracizing one's political or theological opponents. In the case of the last of these three scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah, he rescinded most, if not all of his youthful applications of the takfir mechanism, and actually, by the end of his life, denounced such practices altogether. But unfortunately for the Muslim nation, his writings and fatwas of his takfirs that preceded his uh, belief changes are still being referenced to this day by those who seek justification for their own uneducated or undisciplined fatwas and rulings. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in the early modern era in the Arabian Peninsula, went much further than his inspiration Ibn Taymiyyah. There was not a sectarian specificity to his version of takfir. Upon the reconciliation of his strict interpretations of the Muslim faith, everyone who did not follow or accept his version of the faith was condemned as a kafir. Takfir became so rampant and more common with Abdul Wahhab and reflected the aura of the times. All Muslims were judged, and this included Sunnis that didn't fit Abdul Wahhab's strictness of the faith. A new harshness in applying takfir with no holds barred consequences reigned within this new version of judge, jury, and executioner. Another two centuries unfold and an Egyptian cleric, Sayyid Qutb, began practicing his ideology of takfir. Now with Qutb, it wasn't only the people that were being judged, but also governments and societies as a whole who were outside of the safe zone of Qutb's version of Islam, and also ones existing within a new age of jahiliyyah, ignorance. 
and to delineate the good from the bad, as per his opinion, Qutb would use takfir to stigmatize the bad and thereby justify extreme acts of violence to either overthrow governments or to herd the common people towards his version of the faith. Qutb's mechanism positioned takfir as a stepping stone to then justify jihad, a holy war on all unbelievers, including Muslims. And that is how we get to the likes of the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, Daesh, and the likes. Terrorist groups that claim Islam, yet operate outside of its essence. A slow and developing appeasement of takfir and judgment of others that then justified violence in the name of faith within our modern world. And what's worse, in the name of a faith that is meant to unite and exude peace. With the Islamic State, Takfir becomes a political weapon, far from the tool that was isolated in its use against one or two individuals in antiquity, a weapon to instill fear into the world, and mainly the Islamic Arab world, issuing fetwas of heresy left, right, and center by those who appear to either be limited in their theological understanding or by those who are not of the faith at all. And so, I want to reiterate, there is no earthly authority that is able to apply takfir. Many have lent on fetwas, religious uh, rulings or decrees by high-ranking clerics, to justify the takfir of one individual or another, or a group. But if we look at all early Islamic discourse and legal rulings, no one Muslim has the right to judge others regardless of their perceived disbelief or sins. This is clear. As stated at the outset, this takfir device is used to instill fear and establish separation from those that might defend justified positions contrary to that of the accuser, to make it a sensitive religious and politically incorrect situation that no one wants to touch or be associated with an accused party regardless of justice. It's also imperative to highlight a fundamental factor when it comes to those using takfir. Takfir puts a person into the field of apostasy, Sins, or being sinful, doesn't. So a Muslim who commits sins is still a believer, be it he or she doesn't fully commit to prayer or fasting, they yet remain Muslim. Dressing unconservative or without a hijab does not necessitate that one has left the faith. Yet there are those that will apply the takfir even with such disliked acts. I repeat, sinful does not equate to one being a kafir or an unbeliever. There's a total impropriety regarding the application of takfir. The sequence I listed on how each individual, be the Muslim scholar or cleric or extremist groups, who licensed or practiced takfir at one point in time, is not about accusing them of overstepping their authority or theological knowledge, but it's about providing an analysis on how with every iteration of judge, jury, and executioner, right or wrong, the license to commit Muslims to such a fate became more facilitated more acceptable and hence, easier. It was as if with each reputable scholar who exercised takfir, the gates that confined takfir to non-existence came tumbling down one after the other, until it became commonplace. And that's the world we live in today, where a kid of teenage years can practice takfir on another Muslim simply because they're walking down the street, because he didn't like that person's walk, energy, or aura. How one person can be stigmatized by another who is threatened by him or her, be it along political or social hatred, with an act of takfir that has no merit or ground. Islam is a faith that's intertwined with a person, connected to the core to a level that is inseparable from his or her existence, soul, and spirit. Let's not cheapen this powerful connection through irresponsible takfirs that no human should ever have the right to apply onto another. Or else, that is the true return to the days of ignorance, the Jahiliyyah, when there was no civility, no justice, and when there was no Islam. <laughs>